heart disease and Alzheimer's. Could they be caused by bacteria? We will discuss this and more only here on the People Scientist Podcast. You are listening to the People Scientist the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on nutrition, health, and medicine. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army. Welcome back for another episode on the People Scientist Podcast. Every once in a while, I like to do an episode on the near future exciting treatments in medicine. You know, for example, previously I covered CRISPR gene editing and how scientists have used this new technique to engineer cancer cells to seek out other cancer cells and destroy them in the body. I think it is very exciting to talk about how the latest scientific findings can dramatically change treatments in the very near future for us. So today we are talking all about a new scientific finding that could revolutionize how we approach heart disease and Alzheimer's. Today we are going to talk about specific bacteria as a potential cause of chronic disease such as heart disease and Alzheimer's and how a new very specific antibiotic may lead to a new treatment protocol. So as we always do, let's start off with some core takeaways. There is some compelling evidence that the plaques that build up in the arteries in heart disease and the plaques that build up in the brain in Alzheimer's disease may be very similar. You see, inflammation is implicated in the starting and progression of both of these diseases. The cause of the inflammation in the brain or blood vessels, though, is not completely understood. But one hypothesized cause is due to bacterial and viral infection in places where these bacteria and viruses should not be. For example, there might be bacteria or viruses in the brain, in the neurons of the brain, or inside the lining of the blood vessels, and they don't belong there. But a very specific bacteria in particular has been very strongly linked to both heart disease and Alzheimer's. Recently, a very new and intelligent way to specifically rid the body of this particular bacterial strain without affecting the healthy bacteria of the body has been developed. So does this new technology hold potential to treat or prevent heart disease and Alzheimer's? Well, we hope to find this out in the next few years. So now let's get into the details. Both heart disease and Alzheimer's share a similarity that plaques are implicated in the onset and progression of the diseases. But they are different types of plaque in heart disease versus Alzheimer's. In heart disease, clogged arteries or atherosclerotic plaques are caused by inflammation and infiltration of the blood vessel wall with inflammatory molecules, and this leads to thickened arteries that become narrowed. Now in Alzheimer's disease, the plaques that are in the brain are generated and they form what we call protein aggregates, and they really impair the normal functioning of the brain. They impair the energy metabolism of the brain. They impair the normal neurotransmitter communication release in the brain. And as a result, this alters and prevents normal cognition. But it is currently unclear what causes this initial chronic inflammatory reaction in the brain and in the blood vessels. One emerging hypothesis suggests that infection with bacteria or viruses can contribute either from direct infection of the vascular cells or the indirect effects of some inflammatory molecules such as cytokines and acute phase proteins that are induced by infection that are elsewhere in the body. So this hypothesis has been supported by multiple epidemiological studies that have established 
a positive association between the risk of heart disease, morbidity, and mortality, and the markers of infection. Rosenfeld and Campbell in 2011 wrote a great review discussing the role of bacteria and viruses in heart disease. Now, based on experimental models, the leading paradigm for how heart disease starts is that cholesterol and fat gets deposited in the blood vessel wall, and this is the primary source of the inflammation because the lipids or the fats don't belong inside the blood vessel wall. So the body's immune system says, hey, you know, these don't belong there. We need to do something about it. And essentially it attracts an immune response. However, starting with the discovery of a bacterial strain called chlamydia pneumoniae in human atherosclerotic plaques or clogged arteries, a new hypothesis has now emerged that suggests that bacteria may also contribute to the inflammation in the arteries. Now, bacteria or viruses can contribute to the inflammation within the blood vessel by directly inf infecting those cells and activating the immune response. And the immune response to fight off this bacteria leads to a state of chronic inflammation. And this chronic inflammation leads to the production of foam cells and increases the proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells in the blood vessel wall. And as a result, we have kind of a fibrous material that builds up in the blood vessel wall that leads to the development of a clogged artery or plaque and narrowing of the blood vessel, which essentially is cardiovascular disease. Inflammation is an essential factor in the development of some negative changes to the brain as well that essentially leads to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Now, the cause of that inflammation in the brain and blood vessels is not completely understood either, but again, bacteria or viral infections are a strong hypothesis. Now, out of all the bacteria and viruses that have been investigated, chlamydia pneumonia is the strongest candidate implicated in both heart disease and Alzheimer's. Now, when you hear chlamydia, some people may think of the sexually transmitted disease, but chlamydia pneumonia is different. Chlamydia pneumonia is very common. It's the most common bacteria that contributes to pneumonia and respiratory infections. Now, why might have scientists thought that chlamydia pneumonia might be implicated in dementia. Well, Gerard in 2006 analyzed the brains of individuals who passed away with Alzheimer's or passed away and did not have any Alzheimer's. Now, they detected the transcripts of chlamydia in the brain, and the chlamydia was also viable and active in the brain of those with Alzheimer's, but not in those that died without Alzheimer's. They showed that inflammation was associated with this bacteria in the brain, and they also saw a higher level of astrocytes and microglia, which can indicate a higher level of inflammation in the brain. The cells, along with the neurons, served as the host for the chlamydia in the brain and were in close proximity to the plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles that are implicated in dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Further, Spitzer in 2016 conducted several experiments that showed the beta amyloid plaques found in the brain of those who died with Alzheimer's have potent antibacterial properties. So it is further hypothesized that bacteria may infiltrate the brain and the beta amyloid plaques are generated by the brain in order to protect the brain from the bacteria. But over time, these plaques can impair brain function. But one big remaining question is how does chlamydia pneumonia infiltrate the neurons of the brain and remain active there? Well, actually, it's still not very clear and currently being investigated. Now, the role of chlamydia pneumonia and other bacteria in heart disease has also been investigated thoroughly. Scientists have found this bacteria, again, live and active as they did in the brain, but now in human clogged arteries or otherwise called atherosclerotic plaques. They have not found chlamydia pneumonia in healthy blood vessels, which indicates that if the bacteria is present in the blood vessel wall, then it does lead to some pathological changes and plaque and atherosclerotic development. And in animal models, infection with this particular bacterial strain does actually accelerate the progression of clogged arteries. The fact that this particular bacteria can worsen and accelerate clogged arteries or atherosclerosis has been shown in animal models many, many times. For example, Mozad in 1999, Blessing in 2001, Burnett in 2001, 
Azari Hihi in 2002, Fong in 1997, Harara in 2003, and many, many more. So this has been well established in animal models. But besides chlamydia pneumoniae, other common bacteria have been found in atherosclerotic plaques. For example, to further support the relationship between bacteria and heart disease, periodontal bacteria that are associated with gingivitis have been linked to heart disease and have been found and detected in human clogged arteries. Morrison showed an association between severe gingivitis and an increased twofold higher risk of death from heart disease. So a positive correlation between gingivitis or oral health and heart disease. It is further suggested that bacterial infection and inflammation in the mouth can further perpetuate inflammation elsewhere in the body too. So in this scenario, I think the take-home message is to make sure to see your dentist and to brush and floss your teeth because your oral health may have implications for your overall health too. Now scientists have looked at using antibiotics as a treatment for heart disease and there have been four large clinical trials. There was the WIZARD trial, ACES trial, Clericor, and Prove It Timmy trial. Now, each enrolled over 4,000 patients, and they focused on stable coronary artery disease. Now, unfortunately, none of these studies demonstrated any long-term benefit of antibiotic intervention in patients with established heart disease. Although the WIZARD clinical trial did find a 33% reduction in the incidence of death and heart attack at the six-week mark, but the benefits unfortunately were not sustained long-term. But even though these four clinical trials didn't find any benefit for antibiotic treatment and heart disease, many scientists say that there were large limitations to these four clinical trials and that we shouldn't rule out this hypothesis just yet. For example, the antibiotic treatment that was investigated was in a patient population group with progressive late-stage heart disease. You know, at this point, the inflammation in the plaques have developed substantially. And at this point, antibiotic treatment may not work very well. The antibiotic treatment would likely work best as a preventative agent or in the early stages of the disease to prevent it from progressing even further. Because once the plaque is already substantially developed, it doesn't seem like the antibiotics against chlamydia pneumonia would help very much. Secondly, chlamydia pneumonia is a difficult bacteria to completely eliminate with the current antibiotics that we have today. These difficulties are due to the developmental cycle of chlamydia, in which the infectious but metabolically inactive form, the elementary body, is not susceptible to antibiotics, and the intracellular replicating form can establish persistence. And in the persistent state, the bacteria are not susceptible to antibiotics. So essentially, the current antibiotics are just not very effective. Not to mention that we know antibiotics today are also not very specific, and they kill off a lot of positive, beneficial bacteria, and that can have a negative influence on our health. So what do we need then? Well, what we need is a very specific and more effective antibiotic that will not kill off the beneficial bacteria. Well, some of my very good friends published from the University of Manitoba and the St. Boniface Research Center a paper in 2017 on the creation of a new antibiotic that can do just that. Dubrov, Dubrov, and Pierce in 2017 published a new target for chlamydia that essentially goes after the bacterial's natural way of producing energy. So their new target is the sodium NQR pump. Now they have designed a medicine that can inhibit this sodium pump. So essentially they're cutting off the energy metabolism for chlamydia. And as a result can effectively eliminate chlamydia. This is a far more effective way to target this bacteria versus the current antibiotics that are out there today. This newly designed antibiotic also is superior because it seems to be far more specific. But this antibiotic is in its early stage. But the hope is that in the next five years or so, this technology can be brought to humans to see if it is very effective at targeting chlamydia pneumoniae, and it can prevent or treat stages of heart disease and dementia. That's the hope. I think that medicine that takes the approach of early intervention is the most effective approach. And I can see that our healthcare system is slowly moving toward 
a proactive system rather than reactive. And I hope that in my lifetime, I will see a complete reversal of our system. So that is a wrap, my people scientist army. Today we discussed how one of the causes of heart disease and Alzheimer's could be bacteria that has infiltrated and lives where it shouldn't. It lives in the neurons of the brain and it could live inside our blood vessel walls. As a result, this can lead to inflammation, which can perpetuate clogging of the arteries or atherosclerotic plaques, can also lead to the development of beta amyloid plaques in the brain. And these can lead to dementia and Alzheimer's. It's really interesting. It's like the body's immune system is doing the right thing acutely, you know, in the beginning to try and protect us from bacteria. But over time, when this seems to progress and doesn't resolve, then that is what can lead to these chronic diseases. So our body thinks it's helping us and it is in the beginning, but you know, not when it continues to progress and when it's long term. Your clinical trials have shown that current antibiotic treatment in late stages of heart disease is not effective in reducing heart disease severity. It's not effective for reducing death from heart disease. However, some brilliant scientists have developed a new way to target chlamydia pneumonia that appears to be far more effective and specific to this type of bacteria. If we can use this new approach in those with early stages of heart disease or dementia, or as a preventative therapy in those who have had, for example, many cases of respiratory infection or pneumonia, then perhaps we can see a beneficial effect in the prevention of Alzheimer's and heart disease. We also, as scientists, still need to figure out how this bacteria is infiltrating the neurons of the brain and how it's infiltrating the walls of our blood vessels, because that still has yet to be identified as well. This is why I love being a scientist. Look at how one finding may have the potential to completely change how two diseases are treated. So I hope you all have a super weekend. Now make sure to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. My handles are going to be in the description box to this episode, because every week I like to post some extra information on the week's topic and some insight into my life in the lab. If you have any questions, message me on social media and make sure to share this podcast with a friend. I hope you all have a fantastic week, and I will meet you back here next time on the People Scientist Podcast. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates. Thank you.